Alright, welcome to the Grob Chess Club, grob.tu.com. We are continuing our lecture series on moving up to Class E, which means being rated in between 1000 and 1199. Uh, this is something I think anybody can do. This is Lesson 6, and I've titled it Being a Chess Merchant and Knowing When to Trade. Uh, trading is one of the most important decisions you'll have to make in chess, deciding whether to or whether not to and which pieces to do so with. So I think it's important that we spend at least one lesson on it. And if you followed this lesson and the ones before it and you've taken time in between to you know, play some games and improve things, then I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to pass the 900 rating mark. So we're almost there to Class E. Let's begin. Alright, this lesson isn't only about knowing when to trade. It's also about smart decision making with regards to uh, tempo, which means time it takes to do something, uh, material, which means how many pieces you have, and your attacking power. So, what I mean by this is a tempo in chess, a lot of people aren't familiar with the term, the beginners at least, um, a tempo is a half move, uh, and the loss of a tempo, which means like taking two moves to do what can be done in one, or using three moves to be done what can be done in two, etc., etc., um, can be enough for you to lose a game. Losing tempos is not good. You want to do things as efficiently as possible. If you've ever been in a position where you're almost able to mate your opponent, if you, you know, say you had this piece here and that could have been done in one move, then that means somewhere along the line maybe you lost a tempo and you would have been able to win should you have done it correctly. So we want to try to do things as efficiently as possible because that means our forces are going to get gathered and put in attacking position as fast as possible. So a prime example I can show you is a game that would go e4, e5, and now say the opponent goes bishop b5. This is not a good move because now black is going to be able to develop his pawns and get space for his pieces with tempo. See, now he goes c6 and our bishop goes to c4. Notice that we could have done the same thing. We could have gone e4, e5, bishop c4, and then black wouldn't have had that extra move c6. But now we're a tempo behind. And black, even if he wants here, he can go d5 with tempo. You know, now he's gained all cent uh, center control, and black's actually already better in this game. It's uh, remarkable how fast things can turn if you lose a tempo. And it's not only our own tempos we need to worry about, it's also our opponents. It's actually tempi if you want to be specific, not tempos, but... Um, let's say a game goes e4, e5. This is a game I had recently with one of my students, Cameron uh, Rittenauer. He has one of the games on the site if you've ever browsed through those. Uh, a6, this is a uh, Rui Lopez exchange. All this is book move so far. Bishop g4, h3, and he exchanges. And now Cameron plays a very nice move, queen f6. And this is a very good move because if I take on f6, that means his knight is going to get out. His knight's attacking my pawn. I've helped him develop his pieces faster. I don't want to help him develop his pieces, fa pieces faster. I mean, you know, he's going to have enough fun doing it himself. You never want to help your opponent develop his, pe his or her pieces. You want to develop yours as quickly as possible. So he moves queen six. His queen's a little misplaced. So really, I don't want to exchange that queen because it's going to help him get his pieces developed. So I'm going to sidestep my queen, and now I'm exploiting the fact that he has moved his queen too many times. And if he decides to chase me by going queen g6 here, then maybe I'll exchange because then he'll have to double up his pawns, and his pawn uh, structure is not very pretty. But um, you just want to try to avoid trying to develop your opponent's pieces for them. Another prime example of developing with tempo uh, is another game that would go such as D4, uh, E4, D5. It's called Scandinavian and it has other names as too, center counter and whatnot. And in this position, as white, I always take on D5. Because if the black wants to gain the pawn immediately, he has to take with Queen D5. And now I go with Knight C3. I've developed my knight. I'm attacking his queen. He's going to have to spend two moves now. He's had to move his queen once. He has to move it somewhere else. He's had to waste two moves on his queen while I'm developing normally. So, you know, usually they'll go queen d6 or queen d8 or, or whatnot. But the point is that I've developed my knight with a free move. Essentially, by attacking his queen, I've been given a free move with my knight. And now, if I want to go knight f3 or whatever I want to do, now I'm essentially a move ahead of black. Alright, something else that I tell my students is that when you're up material, generally it's a very good idea to trade off pieces. 
And that's because if you're up material and you trade all the pieces off, if say you get rid of all the pieces and you look at the pawns and that pawn endgame is going to win for you, then generally you want to try to get to that pawn endgame as fast as possible. So in this position, white to move, you notice that white has six pawns to black's three and both have queens. The best move for white here is simply to play queen f4. You're attacking the queen and the king at the same time. You're forcing the trade of queens. So after black either plays queen takes f4 or queen f6, it doesn't matter. Let's say just takes, takes. Now black is going to have no chance to stop all these pawns. You just got to find some way to march one of them to become a queen and the, en the end game is going to be won for you. So you want to try to trade off pieces when you're really far ahead. It doesn't even have to be that much ahead. Uh, you can look at it another way. Let's see. Let's say you've been playing a game and now as white you are very very far ahead material. Let's say you have the queen over the rook and you have six pawns over the three pawns. Well if you get rid of the queen and the rook respectively you'll notice that you're still three pawns ahead and that's still going to be a very nice winning game for you. So in this position uh, there's a num I mean just about every move is going to win for you. But um, as white here I would most likely just play queen takes g5. Because after he takes back with a pawn you realize that it's only a matter of time before I get a pawn down and I win. Or if you want it to be more like the last example, you can even go like queen f4, and then when the rook moves, you can take it. And it, we get the same position as before. And I realize that you're giving away your, your strongest piece in the queen, but it's not going to matter because when you get down to the end game, where we are right now with all the, the pawns, you're going to be able to queen one of the pawns, and the game's going to be won anyway. You want to try to simplify to the easiest end game that you know how to win as possible. Aside from when you're up material or when you're trying to think about regards to tempo, uh, another time you need to know when to trade is when you're attacking or you're being attacked. Uh, so let's say in this position, white to move, he decides he's going to sacrifice a uh, The king doesn't really have any choice here, he's going to take back. And now we play knight g5, check. Uh, if the king goes to g8, uh, the queen's going to come to h5. You're going to run into a lot of trouble. So the best move here is king g6. And now, after queen 4, we reach a very unique position. Because black uh, is being attacked. So black's idea here is that he wants to trade off as much material as possible. If you're being attacked, think of it as being sat on by a fat man. If, you, if a fat man is sitting on you, and there's a lot of pressure on you, you want to try to get that pressure off. You want to try to cut those pounds off so that you're not being so squeezed to death. Uh, as white here, uh, you can think of yourself as a fat man, if you'd like, or you can think of yourself as, say, like a boa constrictor. You want to try to squeeze your opponent to death by putting as much pressure on him as possible. So black here, uh, black here is also up material because white had to sacrifice. So and when you're up material, you try to trade materials. So black here plays the very nice queen takes d4 and now say if white takes on d4 then he's pretty much losing because he sacrificed a piece and he's got nothing for it so instead here white has to keep the pressure on he doesn't want to trade uh, trade the pieces obviously because we just talked about that uh, and he needs to keep the pressure going if he wants to have a chance in this game so he has to play knight g to e4 check he's still putting him in check and the pressure's still there so the king has to run away um, and then we can play the same moves over and over and over again um, actually I think queen h5 also works with the ideas of this but you get what I'm saying uh, and the fact that if you're attacking you don't want to trade off the pieces unless you're getting rid of like the key defender say there's only one defender on that side then maybe you need to get rid of it. You need to evaluate the situation and decide if it's right to do it. But generally speaking, we're talking in generalities here. Uh, generally speaking, you do not want to trade off while you're attacking. And if you're being attacked and you're up material, you try to trade off as quickly as possible and get down to an end game that you can win. It's all about the end game.